there was a tension building and the people feel it. That's why they stayed away from hearing God's word being preached. This is a dead end, my friend. Colonel Beaton still wants your heed. I know my end is near. Capture and execution. Possibly burning at the stake. John, you and the others need to go. Ach, George, let me stay with you. You have been me manager, me guide, me friend, uh, my, my, my Obi-Wan. What are we to do next? Nay, John, you need to go back to teach your pupils. Keep preaching the word of God. But, but George, I can defend you. Ach, I, John, you've been my faithful defender. But nay, my time has come. One is sufficient for sacrifice. A long time ago in a country far, far away. Wait, we're still saying that? Oh, okay. Man, we really need to come up with a better opening. Okay, a long time ago in a country far, far away lived a man named John Knox. He would be used by the Lord to bring a great revival to his country of Scotland. His mentor, George Wishart, was a huge influence on him. Wishart was arrested on a cold December night in 1545 because he taught that the only way a person could be saved was by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. But he was sadly called a heretic and put to death a few months later at St. Andrew's Castle. That castle became a rallying point for the reformers, and soon John Knox found himself teaching there. But some thought he should be a preacher. Ugh, boys, let no day slip without receiving some comfort from the Word of God. Mr. Knox, what scripture is your life verse? I, lad, my life verse. Yes, you know the verse you carry with you all your life. <laughs> That's an interesting way to put it. It'd be hard to narrow it down to one verse, but John chapter 17 is where I first put my anchor. John 17 verse 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's a great truth, ain't it, teacher? Indeed it is. I suppose I could say that 1 Corinthians 15 is also a favorite of mine. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord labor is not in vain. Are those not comforting words to the believer? Yes, sir. And then, of course, that makes me think of... Yes, master, we get it. We shouldn't limit ourselves to just one verse. No, you are learning, my students. The scriptures of God are my only foundation and substance for my life. We better get to chapel. I'm excited to hear Master Ruff preach again. You know, Master Knox, I've been so encouraged in your classes. Have you ever thought of being a preacher? Nay, I'm a teacher, not a preacher. Well, I heard Master Ruff himself say, said that you were you should be a preacher. You, you won't accept that call? Nay, hey, my boy, it's not that simple. He probably won't mention it again anyway. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I, um, I want to speak with you this morning about calling. And the, and the calling of the preacher. One must take the ministry of Christ very seriously. Um, um, for, um, for it is a high calling. If there's no reason to not be a preacher directly from the Bible, one shouldn't ignore the calling. Um, who is the one that I'm speaking of? John Knox. Oh, dear. Do not ignore the calling to minister the Christ church. Fill the pulpit. Join me in the ministry to preach the word of God. <gasps> Mr. Knox, wait! say, Master Knox, it seems God has put you on earth for such a time as this. Och, Alexander, I'm so confused. 
I'm a teacher, a lawyer, and a pretty sick bodyguard. But a preacher? Wish I was the preacher, not me. Leave me be. Oh Lord, why must I be so conflicted? I'm no preacher, yet it seems like he's getting called to do just that. Is this your Holy Spirit? How can I know if this is truly a calling from you? John Knox thought and thought and prayed and prayed for four days about the call to preach. Like Russ said, he could not take it lightly. By the end of that time, the Lord had made his calling clear, and he answered it with gusto, with a force that no Scot had ever heard before. Many people came to hear him preach because he called out the Church of Rome for their false teachings and preached the doctrines of the Bible with such clarity. But this made him a marked man. In June 1547, the castle came under siege by the French. Let's just say they were not for the Reformation. They were sent by the French king to avenge the death of Cardinal Beaton, who had been killed by some extreme supporters of the Reformation. Plus, he wanted to make Scotland Catholic again. After a month of chaos and bombs, yeah, a month, the Protestants there, including Knox, were forced into slavery on a French ship. Hey, you! Yeah, you! Why don't you kiss the wooden? Eh? <laughs> cute? It's not cute! It's an idol! And this idol is accursed, and I won't bow to it! Let our lady save herself. She's light enough. Let her learn to swim. Hey! That's my only one! <laughs> After a deal with the new King of England, Edward VI, the prisoners were released after 19 long months. But it still was not safe for John Knox to return to Scotland, so he went to England. Knox eventually was called to preach under the order of Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cramner, in a little town called Berwick-upon-Tweed. This is where he would minister for two years, seeing the town change through the gospel. Knox continued to preach against the false teachings of the Roman Church, especially the Mass. Soon he would be called to Newcastle because the Church of England was concerned about his teachings. Now wait, I know what you're thinking. You thought that King Henry VIII was declared the head of the Church of England and that England separated from the Church of Rome, didn't you? It did, in name, but there were still some who held to the Catholic beliefs and traditions, those very beliefs and traditions that Knox saw as idolatry and unbiblical. John Knox, you know why you've been called to this council today? Sure I do, to stand up for what is in the word of God. Oh, really? Yes, how can you defend yourself? Gain your congregation communion? In your own way, and not the way of the Church of England? My way? My way? Who do you think I am? Frank Sinatra? The way I give communion is God's way. God gives us instructions in his word. There are no extras needed. No unnecessary traditions. Are you familiar with the passage of 1 Corinthians 11:27? The Apostle Paul writes, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. If we are making a show of the sacrament of the Lord's table, is this really taking communion in a worthy manner? That man is a good speaker. No, he's not. Huh. Actually, he's pretty good. Let him go. Malt balls. Uh, sure, why not? Okay, John, you can go. But no marbles for you. Shortly after, Knox was surprisingly called back to Newcastle to preach. He became so popular that his fellow Scotsmen came over to hear him preach. His popularity soon became known to King Edward VI, and the king asked him to be his chaplain. So John Knox found himself in merry old London. Wait, 
Not that London. Big Bang came a few hundred years later. Yeah, that's better. Okay, now where was I? Oh yes, so John Knox went to London to preach for the king in fancy places like Windsor Castle, St. James Palace, Westminster Abbey, and the Hampton Inn. No, wait, that's the Hampton Court. He was even asked by the king to do two very important jobs, but Knox turned them both down, believing that the Church of England still held too many Catholic traditions. Ezra, Ezra, read all about it. King Eddie dies, Gaze and Jay becomes queen. Ezra, Ezra, read all about it. Gaze and Jay in prison. Mary takes the phone. I've got a bad feeling about this. After Mary, who was really Catholic, came to the throne, Knox decided it was getting a little too dangerous to stay in England. Many who stood in the way of her beliefs were executed. Soon she was called Bloody Mary. So Knox went into exile to Geneva, where John Calvin was ministering to many refugees. Calvin was an encouragement to Knox, and the two, having similar beliefs, became good chums. Knox and Calvin worked on the translation of the Geneva Bible. Knox spent five years exiled in Europe. Now the scene was set in Scotland for Knox to return to a land ready for reformation. Queen Bloody Mary died. The Scottish people had grown tired of the bloodshed, and on May 2nd, 1559, is that who I think it is? Um, Sir William Wallace? No. That's Mel Gibson. What? No. Well, who do you think it is? Ugh, it's John Knox. Oh, uh, yeah, off your head. Yeah, he hasn't been here for 12 years. Ugh, no, it's him, all right? Knox's supporters were happy to see him back in Scotland, and he came in peace. But the new queen, Mary Guise, was not convinced of that and declared Knox an outlaw. So he and his supporters went to the reformed town of Perth, where Knox preached an inspiring sermon in response. No matter the cost, we must keep carrying on the message of the gospel. We don't need idols or traditions of the unbiblical mass. We need to focus on what the scripture alone instructs us to do and how we ought to worship God and live in all of life. Despite the fact that the Catholic mass was now illegal in Scotland, Mary Queen of Scots, the last Mary in the Knox story, yes, there were three different Marys and they all didn't like Knox. So Mary Queen of Scots held an illegal mass. I heard Knox doesn't like that I held mass. Mary, send this message to Mr. Knox to summon him here. I need to have a word with that man. Yes, Your Majesty. Your Majesty, Mr. John Knox has arrived. John Knox, you preach from scriptures one way, and the Catholic Church teaches another way. Who do I believe? Madame, you should believe God, who clearly speaks in his word. The word of God is plain in itself. If there is anything unclear in one place, the Holy Spirit, which never contradicts himself, explains the same more clearly in other places. Well, you make it sound so easy. Doesn't he marry? Yes, Your Majesty. He sure does. Knox spoke with Mary again and again. And again, and again. They met several times, and each time, Mary grew more emotional than the next. Knox sought each time to speak the truth of the scripture to her, plainly and calmly. <laughs> you have no business commenting on my affairs. Who do you think you are anyway? I'm Knox, John Knox. And I'm here simply sharing the truth that is in God's word. 
The scriptures are my only foundation and substance in all matters of weight and importance. Ugh! You just bring out the worst of me! Look at me! I'm a mess! Your Majesty, you are a beauty to the whole. <laughs> really? <laughs> you flatter me. Your Majesty, if I may speak, your beauty is like a rose. Madame, in God's presence I speak. I never delight in the weeping of any of God's creatures. I can hardly handle the tears of my own sons after disciplining them. Much less can I rejoice in your majesty's weeping. But saying I have offered to you no reason to be offended, but have just spoken truth as my job calls me to do, I must endure your majesty's tears, even though I don't really want to. Rather than go against my conscience or betray the welfare of the public and the church through my silence, can I offer you a traditional Scottish beverage to cheer you up? Every time Mary, Queen of Scots, met with Knox, he kept a firm hold on his emotions, standing for the truth he knew to be in God's word. Mary didn't ever embrace that truth, and perhaps that is why she uh, became unhinged. She got mixed up in a lot of things, which caused her to abdicate her throne to her infant child, James, and got her out of Scotland. You would think that this would make it easy for Knox to continue the Reformation in Scotland. However, some of Mary's fan club tried to get Mary back on the throne. They were clearly a threat to Knox. So, Knox had to flee Edinburgh for a while, and he headed back to a safer place, the place where it all began. St. Andrews. Mr. Knox, it's so good to see you here. Care for some company? Aye, lads. Sit. Mr. Knox, your preaching makes me so weak. I tremble and I can't take notes. You are indeed an extraordinary man of God. So true. I sweat more under your preaching than I do doing push-ups. It is wholly by the grace of God that I can stand and preach. God made me to preach, and when I preach, I feel his pleasure. It is with his passion that I can preach the gospel in a way that stirs the soul of any man. And, I must say, you can share the same passion in how you live and share the gospel. Ah, oh, you're spot on. This is good stuff. Good stuff indeed. What wisdom would you share with us today, Mr. Knox? Boys, use wisdom on how you use your time. Like, don't even bother with TikTok. You need to use what energy you have for the cause of the gospel, for the cause of Christ. TikTok, sir? But with all this controversy, how do you stay focused on the cause of Christ? Yeah, you've dodged death and danger so many times. Ugh, lads. At the end of the day, live in Christ, die in Christ, and the flesh need not fear death. John Knox went back to Edinburgh when it was safe and preached up until just before his death when he could no longer get out of bed. But even from his deathbed, he passionately shared the gospel and exhorted other Christians. Knox met his savior on November 24, 1572. At the age of 57, his gospel influence on Scotland and the church around the world has been seen for centuries. God used his humble passion for knowing and sharing the scriptures to transform many lives and help fuel the Reformation. We thank the Lord for the life and ministry of John Knox.
Knox, Knox. Who's there? John. John who? John Knox. Let's Knox tell that joke again. <laughs> <laughs>